This morning we talked about Jesus as our high priest and as the sacrifice that the high priest took into the Holy of Holies, Jesus having entered into the heavenlies to prepare a place for us. I want us to look at an example that Luke gives us of just how well that system worked, even at the time when the high priest was making his sacrifice, that there were people who were changing their hearts and changing their minds and changing their eternal uh, destinies because they believed that God could do something through this high priest. And so I want us to look at Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32. Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32. As I was growing up, there was a quartet song that was very popular at the time called I'm Saved Like the Criminal on the Cross. Anybody remember that, that particular arrangement? I think the, uh, maybe the Sounds of Glory or the Gospel Airs, one of those two groups, has it on one of their tapes. You would enjoy the song, uh, but I heard a lot of sermons preached during those days about how that song was wrong that uh, we were saved in a different way because of the blood of Christ and because of our baptism into Christ, that the thief on the cross died under the old covenant. And there are a lot of things that are dissimilar about our salvation and the salvation of this thief we're going to read about. But there's one thing that is particularly important and is exactly the same, and that is that repentance and a change of heart always precedes forgiveness and salvation. And so we're going to look at a time when the high priest was sacrificing himself, he was on the cross for our sins, and he had an encounter with somebody who needed forgiveness. There were two others with him, criminals, who were led with him to be put to death. When they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. They divided his garments and cast lots. The people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The, say, the uh, soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew that read, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me. In paradise. One of the most beautiful passages of all the New Testament because you see the difference of how people respond to the sacrifice. On the one hand, you have a man who continues to just cast aspersions at Jesus. He cares nothing about Jesus. He cares nothing about Christ's kingdom. He doesn't see a need in himself for forgiveness. He just makes fun. He just pokes fun at the whole idea that Jesus is someone important. On the other side, we have a man who even at the point of death realizes that he's there because he deserves to be there. But the man being crucified next to him has done nothing wrong. So he sees Jesus' righteousness and he clings to that righteousness in the hope that maybe Jesus can undo the damage that's been done in his life. Now we hold that in common, don't we? Whatever else might be different about the way that we were saved and the way that this criminal was saved, the one thing we hold in common is that knowledge that there's something wrong in our life that we can't fix and that the man on the cross can. Lord, will you remember me when you come in your kingdom? That's the prayer we pray, isn't it? That's what we want. When all is said and done, when all of life is over, when we finally have to stand before the judgment seat, the one thing we really want is Jesus, can I be with you in your kingdom? I want to be where you are. I want to be part of your existence. I want the forgiveness that only you can offer. And Jesus says to this thief, and I assume they'd never met before, 
I assume they'd never had the opportunity to sit down to meal together or to visit about the things that were going on in this man's life. But Jesus looks into his heart and he sees repentance and he offers forgiveness. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. If we will repent, if we will realize that we have something wrong with us that we can't fix, and that Jesus, who had nothing wrong with him, died as a substitute sacrifice for you and I, then we're well on our way toward the forgiveness that can only be offered through his blood. But here hangs the high priest, the sacrifice, the only beloved son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the thief recognized that that was his only hope. And he acted on his repentance and on his hope that Jesus could change things. That's what we ask of ourselves, is it not? Each one of us needs to look deep into our hearts day after day, week after week, until the Lord comes back to get us. We see what's wrong with us. We see what's right with our great high priest. And we ask him, will you forgive me? Can I be with you where you are? If you need to respond to the invitation... Maybe there's something amiss in your life that needs the attention of the great high priest, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. If we can help you at all, we want to as we sing.